All right, so I've seen this uh, topic. I don't want to call it a debate. I've seen this topic um, crop up in a few places now. And I suppose it's probably worth addressing um, this whole question of uh, does the car make the drive or does the driver make the car? Uh, it's, it's worth addressing at this point. So firstly, what role does the driver play in the car's development aside from, you know, driving it fast on on the, on the Sunday and weekends? What role does the driver play in the car's development? Because none of the engineers can get into the car. Well, they, they could get into the car, but they probably wouldn't be able to push the car to its uh, maximum performance delta and see what it's doing <laughs> at that performance envelope. They probably wouldn't be able to do that. I say probably, they definitely wouldn't be able to do that. And while at max performance delta, you have to know what, how the car is behaving, and then you get back to the garage or even on radio, and you tell the engineer what it's doing. That's what the drivers are doing, you know, most of the time. Most of the time, free practice on Friday and Saturday, that's what the drivers are doing. Even on qualifying, they're doing that. So at all moments, the driver has to provide feedback on how the car is behaving to the engineers so that they can make the car better for the driver. So if the driver fails to do that, what's going to happen? They're going to get a bad car. All right, you, you see this with, um, well, you saw it, I suppose, last season with uh, Sonoda, because he, his own words, he didn't really understand what he was doing when encountering the F1 weekend, he doesn't know why, oh, he probably knows now, but he didn't know why, you know, why, why, why are we doing this free practice thing, why do I have to talk to the engineer on radio to tell him what I'm doing, I'm trying to practice the track, why do I have to talk to him to tell him what the car's doing, I can wait till we're in garage, right, that's Yuki's logic, and you know, that, that logic doesn't pan out, because the engineers, they need to know what's actually happening with the car, Otherwise, they can't make the car better for the driver. And this is just all around. This is just, this exists top to bottom in the grid. And it's a perpetual job the drivers have to do. It's a perpetual job. There's, there's one retired driver who was renowned for having brilliant feedback. We could probably attribute that to his personality. But Kimi Raikkonen, he was brilliant on feedback. Many teams loved working with him because when, when he talked about the car, and this is another thing when it comes to drivers communicating with engineers, that there's a lexicon gap over there. There's a lexicon gap. Drivers are not really going to be able to communicate pitch and yaw and, uh, you know, maybe the roll bar is set up uh, incorrect or, you know, the springs are too tight. The drivers are not really going to be able to communicate that. They'll just com communicate what they feel from the seat. Oh, the car's sliding at the back and this or that corner. There's understeer here, there's oversteer there. That's really all the driver can communicate. Now, there's been some drivers through the years who've been able to get past that uh, uh, base level of lexicon. They have indeed. Uh, Alexander Wirtz would be one. Uh, he was quite popular among engineers for that. I'm not too sure what Kimi's level of lexicon was, but you know, considering multiple teams <laughs> considered him brilliant with uh, engineers' feedback, uh, you know, we can take some liberties there and say that yeah, he probably did have some engineering lexicon down, and he had the correct definitions for those words down. But most drivers, they don't, they don't have that. So generally, what happens is they get back to to garage, they. They either talk to the designer or trusted engineer who understands how they communicate and they try and figure out how to make this car better together. So now when a driver gets a bad car and like, you know, I don't know if I've said it already, but there's your one out of 10 instance where it really is just an engineering flaw and you're not going to really get anything better with um, driver feedback. I should probably mention that right now, but nine times out of 10, the reason a driver has a bad car is because they can't actually advise their engineers on what's going on with the car. Alright, because all the engineers are smart. I mean, yes, there's genius Nui and there's genius Pedromo 
and genius Ellison and all of that. There's all these type of genius designers in, in the group, but really, they're like all geniuses at the end of the day. This is, you know, we don't say that too loud, but they're all geniuses at the end of the day. So you've got all these genius engineers and they're all, well, before they were gated by money. Now they're not really gated by money. They're going to be gated by expertise and knowledge. And that's all going to come down to, well, what does the driver say the car is doing? Because I'm sure you've seen this sometime through this season, this season already, where, well, you'd have to watch a lot of the weekend, I suppose. But for anyone who does watch like the full weekend and all of that and by full weekend i just mean like the free practice sessions when the cars are out on circuit you watch all of that you'll you'll have noticed some instances where verstappen is talking with um adrian newey of course he's talking about what the car's doing there's nothing else for them to talk about right this formula one but there's been instances there's been instances where he's talking with Adrian Newey about what the car is doing and Adrian what he's gonna do is he's gonna go back to the drawing board and try and design a piece for the car that actually fixes the problem that a Max Verstappen would be identifying to you know so if your driver can't do that then well they're probably never gonna get a good car or even if they do get a good car they're not gonna be able to maintain that good car and then, of course, to address the driver versus car scenario even, even more, right? If it's all the car, you also have to explain outlier results like um, Pasta Maldonado winning at um, Spain 2012. Formula One channel uploaded this highlight recently. You have to explain that. You have to explain Damon Hill's pace in Hungary 97, almost won him a Grand Prix. You gotta explain that. You gotta explain all types of outliers where there was no, you know, where there was no um, incident or safety car scenario or anything that changed the complexion of the race. You have to be able to explain those if it's all the car and never the driver. And you still have to really have a good explanation for those if it's 90% car and 10% driver. You see, you have to be able to rationalize all of that out and if you can't then you know the logic that you're presenting is probably is probably flawed in an f1 in an f1 sense so we got this news article here with michael schumacher and he says well if you're part of the team then you're partly responsible for the car this was in reference to fernando alonso talking about um, ferrari's 2013 title challenge and that one alonso that one that one's on your head that one's on your head. I mean, this was before budget cap and everything, so Ferrari had ample money to throw at it. So that's on your head now. You see, this is the difference um, with this budget cap era and pre-budget cap era. When you get a bad car and your team has infinite resources to implement your feedback, when you get a bad car, that's on you as the driver. That's on you. Regardless of whatever problems Ferrari might have had at the time, regardless, like, forget about all that. Right? It's relevant, but not as relevant as the driver actually getting feedback, right? Because if the car starts winning, all these problems that are existing in the background, they fall away. No one's gonna, no one's really gonna be committed to them. At least internally, maybe externally, people will be committed to them, right? But here, in this F1 space, when you have a good car as a driver, you are actually supposed to maintain that car. And if you can't maintain that car, well, we're going to see it in the final result. All right, you better believe we're going to see it in the final result. And this is why I've never, I've never put stock in, oh, it's all the car or anything. I never put stock in any of those arguments because they just don't make sense. And even you have to address the whole issue of uh, intra-team or inter-team dynamic you have to address that you know why is Perez consistently slower than Verstappen if they have the same car why did Bottas not do what Sir Lewis Hamilton did in the Mercedes or driving the same car in this Mercedes space so you know they're exactly the same car <laughs> right they might be set up different but it's exactly the same car now, even if you say, oh, Sir Lewis got a, better, got a better setup, he set the car up that way. 
His feedback got the car in that state. You see? Max Verstappen, when he's got the fastest car over a race weekend, whose feedback got the car in that state? Max Verstappen's. Leclerc, when he's got the fastest car of the weekend, whose feedback got the car in that state? It was Leclerc's. So you see, I never put much stock into this, um, it's all, it's all a car. <laughs> I never put much stock into that. I mean, it would be more worthwhile to discuss, um, which driver has had the biggest impact on, on, on a car's performance delta. That would, that would be more, th that would be more worthwhile to discuss, but never, never, ever, like, or that car's just, uh, so dominant, so none of these... Yes, there are some dominant cars that crop up here and there, but that dominance is really one or two years of complete dominance. And then all the other teams catch up because the cars, the cars to be raced in public. There's cameras everywhere. You can take a snap. I mean, look, look man. Look, um, the racing points, they took so many snaps of the car, they were able to recreate it. And it's not like that car was, you know, it's not like that car was as dominant as people painted it out to be. Granted, it's a whole year later, but they did copy the whole thing. And that car was nowhere near as dominant as it, as it was the previous year. Sure, there's been developments, but it's not like the car was consistently finishing top 10 or even consistently finishing in the top 6. Even in the top 8. So if it is indeed all the car and never on the driver, then, you know, there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of details throughout F1's history that you, you would quite frankly have to rationalize in order to say that and, you know, try <laughs> and actually try and uh, get away with it in, in a space where you're, where, in a space where you're open to having your right ideas questioned. You really have to cover a lot of bases. And even a Kimi Raikkonen, who was brilliant with feedback, right? Even a Kimi Raikkonen is brilliant with feedback. He never got, a, well, he did get cars that could win championships, but he was never able to put the championship winning, the championship winning uh, run together again. Even a title challenging run, but I mean, you can't say that too loud. People are gonna get upset. But he wasn't able to put that together again even with best feedback on the grid. Now why is that? Because he's lost out on ability to Sebastian Vettel. But if it was all the car, guess what? They would have been on even pegging the whole season through. There would never have been any sort of divider between the drivers. There wouldn't have been any of that. So really, this is why I just... I just I just find the whole art was all the car thing, I just find it so jarring. I really do. Because now your guy's gonna win. And it's gonna look comfortable in some places, right? Probably. Be your guy Charles Leclerc or be your guy Max Verstappen. It's gonna look comfortable in some places. And believe you me, you, you, you aren't gonna want people saying, oh, it's all the car. Because it's not all the car. And your own eyes are telling you that, that it's not all the car. Because if it was all the car, guess what? The teammates right next to him. And you might say, oh, they started next to each other on the grid, the Ferraris. Well, Sainz fell back, like, he just fell back. He couldn't keep up with the tempo of those two up front. He just couldn't. Same thing happens with Perez. He just can't keep up with Verstappen's tempo. So if it's all the car, then, you know, all these gaps and drivers, they shouldn't exist. We could say it's all the car if, I don't know, we go with the full, um, <laughs> we go with the full robo driver thing and we actually have robots driving the cars. If we go with that, then sure, we can talk about, oh, is it the car, is it not the car, because whatever AI they put in these things will have perfect execution throughout the whole, <laughs> throughout the whole season. And that's another thing. People think um, F1 is a performance sport. I mean, the races performative <laughs> but it's not all the way performative this is a this is an execution sport you have to execute 
and actually produce the lap time that the car is capable of. You have to execute on that as driver. In qualifying, you have to execute on that. In the race, you have to execute lap after lap. Perfect turn and perfect acceleration, perfect braking. You have to execute that lap after lap after lap. And if you get it wrong on just one lap, you might lose the race off of that. You might lose your point scoring position off of that. You might lose your, your highest classification of the season after that. So no, I don't, I don't, I just don't buy into the whole, it's all the car. I just, I just don't. Quite frankly, I find those comments um, ignorant, like truly ignorant. I mean, I, I can't even, <laughs> there's a stronger word than ignorant, but uh, I probably can't. I can't even think of what it is right now. I, I can only think of curse words right now, but there's a stronger word than ignorant for what like, that take is. Right, maybe S9 or something. But it's a really poor take because it just doesn't hold any congruent logic as soon as we start investigating F1 on any, on any level of depth. Even just what happens on Sunday, if you only watch Sunday races, even just on that on that level of depth, you you're gonna say, "Oh, this car narrative it doesn't really fit." So that's my note for today. It's always the driver, even when the car is supremely dominant. It's always the driver. But anyway, peace. Hell breezy. Let me show you how to keep the dice rolling when you're doing that thing over there. Hey, 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 Let's go. Cause I'm feeling like I'm running and I'm feeling like I gotta get away, get away, get away. Better know that I don't and I won't ever stop. Cause you know I gotta win every day, day. Go. See if you really wanna pop me. Go. Just know that you will never pop me. Go. And I know that I gotta be a little cocky. Go. You ain't never gonna stop me. Every time I come a nigga gotta set it, then I gotta go and then I gotta get it, then I gotta blow and then I gotta shut it. Any little thing a nigga think that he be doing cause it doesn't matter cause I'm gonna da 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 Then I'm gonna murder everything and anything about it. Boom, about it. Do a lot of things to make it clearer to a couple niggas that I always win and I gotta get it again and again and again. And I be doing it to death and now I move a little foul. I nigga better call a rap and everybody know my style. I niggas know that I'm the best when it come to doing this and I be banging on my chest and I bang in the east and I banging in the west and I come to give you more and I will never give you less. You will hear it in the street and you can read it in the press. Do you really wanna know what's next? Let's go. See the way we own it and we all up in the race and you know we got it going to try to keep up with the pace. If we struggling and hustling and sell it and I get it and we always gotta do it. Take it to another place. Gotta taste it and I gotta grab it and I gotta cut off.